Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to the final seminar in our, our series uh, where conservative uh, politicians in partnership with academics reflect on contemporary issues of inequality, inequity, poverty, insecurity. And we attempt to think through together uh, the cycle of policies that in response might ameliorate or indeed solve um, some of these issues that now confront us in quite a stark manner. So it's with great pleasure uh, that I open up and chair this uh, panel today. If you want to tweet about it, it's hashtag Tories Against Poverty. I thought it'd best be clear about what we're uh, trying to do and pull off. And, and so you're welcome to, to use that. This event is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, afterwards. And do please uh, raise questions uh, through the Q&A function and I will um, mark them uh, <clears throat> if we're going to answer them live and we'll bring you on and uh, you can ask them and it creates a nice kind of dynamic environment. So this final um, panel, this final seminar uh, in this session in the series is on social security. And of course, the one of the most important questions there is what do we mean by social security? Who is it for? Who is it meant to serve? Do we want to concentrate social security at the very, very bottom for those who are most extreme? Or do we want social security to extend uh, further up to the bottom 50%, the bottom 60%? But well, the trouble is if we create a, a system where uh, the top half pays and only the bottom half benefits, you inevitably set up um, a regime in which the top half increasingly protests against funding the bottom half and support in, is inevitably curtailed. One of the most interesting things, I think, going back into the philosophy uh, and history of the welfare state is the most successful systems are those where, where everybody benefits. Think of the NHS. You know, no party would think of trying to challenge those central principles now. And yet those central principles in welfare have been successfully challenged because for, as our, for a variety of reasons, as our society has become more and more unequal and <clears throat> those who are doing very well have done very well time and time again, and those wealth benefits and social benefits are passed to their children, passed to their environment. These people increasingly don't feel insecure. And increasingly, we've developed in the welfare system a them and us type situation where they, those who are doing well, who don't feel the, the perniciousness of, of some of our uh, inequalities, feel that they don't want to fund or support such uh, people who suffer from them. And indeed, one of the anthropological problems of human beings is, is that we find it very difficult to extend our mind and our sympathies to those who are unlike us, who uh, haven't experienced, who, who experience things that we can't really conceive of or understand. And generally speaking, as societies, probably since the dawn of time, have been run by the successful, who aren't particularly pleasant towards the unsuccessful. However, they're deemed absent great social movements, such as monotheism or, or various moral revivals, which do happen. This is the norm. So the interesting question for us is how do we create a welfare system that speaks to the levels of insecurity that many of those, I, I don't like these divisions, but, but they have sociological accuracy, in the bottom half of the income distribution or the bottom half of the wealth distribution are feeling, which I long argued is best characterized by the word insecurity. How do we create a, a system that renders them more uh, secure? We know, for instance, that um, economic penalty isn't just a, enacted upon current actors, it's enacted upon their children and on their children's children. And it's enacted on the place in which those uh, people grow up, the schools they go to, we are in many ways a deeply class segregated society. And in terms of all the penalties, it's class in our society 
that carries the largest penalty. And you will all know the report from Robert Halpern's committee yesterday about white working class, that they, for various reasons, largely in my view to do with cultural and economic segregation, suffer the greatest penalty uh, in terms of education and educational advancement. So what are we going to do to create a system that can at least ameliorate that, that or genuinely turn it around? I don't, uh, many of you will have visited um, parts of Scandinavia, for instance, where they don't really in any feasible sense have anything like the working class that we do. They don't have, suffer the levels of inequality or the penalty that you recognize just through travel that these things are contingent, but in our culture, they're hardwired. So what really interests me is what can we do to create a system that actually tackles um, the problems that people are now experiencing? And I think part of what those answers must be mustn't be to concentrate just on those at the extremes. We have to secure as much of society as we can, precisely because that will create mass support for the system that does so. But what's most interesting, if you look at the various surveys, is that, is that lots of people, particularly those in the working class, have very aggressive attitudes towards welfare. And they want to make it uh, conditional, means tested, or not given at all. So we've got a quite a complex range of social factors at play, and yet the needs have, have arguably never been greater. If you look at the, um, the recent uh, Metrics Commission report, those in deep poverty has come to around four and a half million of our own citizens. Poverty and extreme poverty, in certain cases, those who, who are destitute, as Helen has, uh, will point out, has, has risen by 50% in recent years. So we're creating an, in, an incredibly extreme society and our system doesn't seem to be able to either intellectually, morally, or in actuality deal with it. So I couldn't think of a better uh, range of people uh, here to uh, address these. And what we're going to do is turn to the academics first uh, and the researchers and the policy specialists to outline what um, we hope to the long-term trends that the policy response has to speak to. So first of all, I'm delighted to welcome Fran Bennett, who's Honorary Researcher, Department of Social Policy and Intervention at the University of Oxford. And she very kindly is going to speak about social security, key trends and issues. So Fran, um, I'm delighted to say it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip, and thank you very much to Ray's Publica for inviting me. Can you hear me all right? Can I just check first? Good. None of us have slides, so you don't need to look at slides. Um, as Philip said, I'm going to be talking about um, Social Security, and Helen will talk more about poverty. Uh, I'm going to raise some broad issues, and I want to emphasise I'm talking about people of working age and below. I'm not going to be talking about the other huge um, uh, um, aspect of pensions. And I'm going to raise some issues and uh, suggest some directions for change. So first, I wanted to look at the aims of Social Security provision. Why do we have a Social Security uh, system at all? Um, and to say, first of all, that it's a core part of the welfare state, like education, like health. Um, and Keris Cooper and the late lamented Sir John Hills uh, wrote recently about uh, four core overlapping aims of Social Security. One is explicitly about poverty, and so it's about the prevention and the relief of poverty. We use Social Security for that. But we also use Social Security for other aims which would reduce the risk of poverty, do reduce the risk of poverty, but are also wider. And those include, for example, providing individual insurance to protect income against shocks to the system to smooth incomes over the life cycle. And that's not just uh, for pensions, but also when you have children or when you have other caring responsibilities. And to reduce horizontal inequalities. And by that, I mean the extra costs that some people have no matter what their income is. So for example, the extra costs of disability that we provide various benefits for. Now you could meet some of those aims in other ways. 
And in fact, sometimes we do that. So, for example, you can have private provision of insurance, for example. You can have occupational benefits, occupational sick pay, maternity pay and so on. You can have tax allowances and reliefs, although we have some fewer of those now than we used to. But those may have different distributional effects from providing for those aims through Social Security. So that was the first section I wanted to talk about. The other was um, key recent trends in Social Security. Where are we now? Where are we at? And some of those trends are specific to the UK and some of them are shared internationally. And the first one I would say is the rise of means testing in recent years. Now, in fact, what we call categorical benefits have also risen. So those are benefits such as uh, those to meet the extra costs of disability, which don't have a contribution test and they don't have a means test either. Those have gone up as well as a percentage. But means tested benefits have gone up particularly. And there's been a reduction, on the other hand, in the share of contributory benefits, which are contribution based, at least for people of working age, not pensioners. And I think that's part of the reason why we introduced new schemes in the pandemic to help with the income shocks that people suffered. We introduced the coronavirus job retention scheme and the self-employment income support scheme, partly because um, our uh, benefit schemes no longer perform that function uh, all that well. Um, so the greater reliance of uh, means tested benefits focuses on one of those aims that I talked about. And in fact, on only part of one of those aims I talked about, because it focuses on the relief of poverty. So the idea about means tested benefits is that you target scarce resources. Some people argue that the way in which you means test people divides people into recipients and payers. In a sense, Philip was talking about some of these tensions and that that may not be the best way to maximize the resources available for social security. And of course, there's also a tension between giving money to those who are in poverty only and helping people to escape poverty. And that's the uh, well-known problems of incentives that we know about. There's also a problem of take up usually with means tested benefits in particular. So a benefit such as child benefit, for example, reaches those parts that benefits specifically for the poor don't tend to reach. Uh, in other words, it's got a higher take up rate uh, than means tested benefit. So that's one uh, big area of um, uh, a key trend uh, has been an increase in means testing. Another is the increasing focus on employment, and that's uh, in two ways. One is on activation and one is in work support. So in terms of activation, activation and this is shared between uh, with other countries as well, there's been an increase in uh, what you might call conditionality. And that's both in the scope of conditionality in terms of which uh, groups it includes and uh, the intensity of conditionality, what people have to do in return for their benefits. And I think that's because of the um, prominence at the moment of the supply side of economics and because work is seen as the best route out of poverty. Um, and this has happened under um, governments of both political persuasions, I should say. Um, but there's also, of course, in parallel with this trend, been an increase in precarity in the labour market, uh, insecurity that Philip was talking about quite rightly at the beginning, um, and also a rise in in-work poverty that's gone uh, along with that. And those uh, issues have also preoccupied policymakers alongside um, activation. The other thing I have to mention is the Social Security spending cuts, <coughs> excuse me, the Social Security spending cuts, which were particularly a result of decisions made um, in the wake of the financial crisis in both 2010 and 2015 in particular. Some of those were general measures which affected many people, but gradually, uh, such as the freeze in most working age benefits, not all. And some of them were more specifically focused, but affecting people in a much uh, bigger way. So for example, uh, we've just found out that there are now 200,000 um, uh, families who are affected by the uh, benefit cap, uh, which limits the amount of benefit that you can get for um, uh, people out of work, um, unless with, with various exceptions. So those are some of the trends um, that have been going on uh, in Social Security. What about key issues in Social Security for people of working age and below for the future? The first one I would raise is the one that Philip raised right at the beginning, which is the public support for Social Security. 
So what is the best way to ensure public support for the kind of social security system that we might want? In particular, if we want to do something not just about poverty, but about wider insecurity. And I think this is partly how we talk about the system and how we talk about the people who depend on the system. And I think that's partly to do with politicians and not just about the media. And again, I would say this affects both political parties who've been in government um, in recent years. I should say all, sorry, because of the coalition. Uh, all political parties who've been in government um, in recent years. I think the language is important. Um, and how we talk about who the social security system is for as well, whether it's just for a particular group or whether it's for all of us. I think it's also about the balance between means tested and other benefits, which I've talked about already. Um, and there are discussions currently going on about the contributory system, in particular, short term earnings related benefits for income shocks are being talked about again for the first time for many years. One of the issues there, I think, is about um, the tension between stakeholding on the one hand. So I've got a stake in this. This is my system versus inclusiveness. So who is in it together, if you like, um, how inclusive your system can be if it's also a system that is stakeholding. The second issue, again, that Philip raised is the reinforcing of the security in social security. I'm increasingly convinced that security is the key, not just for people on benefits, and that's particularly families with children who suffer especially from insecurity, I think, in trying to give their children a decent upbringing, but also potentially for the public willingness to finance the kind of social security system we might want to see. And here I would take issue slightly with Philip because he was talking mostly about people at the very top who might not think that they were, that social security was anything to do with them. He did go on, however, to talk about other people um, who, if you like, resented those people on benefits um, and who might be much closer to them in terms of income. And I think the insecurity that people feel is not a good basis as a foundation for a generous social security system which helps people uh, in the way we might want. Um, child benefit and carers allowance in particular have been acting as a safety net interestingly and paradoxically for people on universal credit in recent months and i know this because we're doing some with the university of bath doing some research on universal credit and couples these benefits are regular they don't change they're not reassessed every month as universal credit is which may lead to volatility in income so it is important to have some benefits that are actually a foundation of security and are not so responsive. There are good things about responsiveness, but there are some things which are good if they are uh, benefits which continue and don't change all the time. And they have been acting as a safety net for people whose universal credit have been disrupted. The third issue, I think, is adequacy of benefit rates. And I'm going to leave that more to Helen to talk about. Uh, and the fourth issue, I would say, is treating claimants with dignity and respect. Now, the way that sanctions has be, have been dealt with has changed for the better just recently. Uh, I think it's incredibly important because it's the fear of sanctions, not just sanctions, uh, that actually uh, damages people on benefits. Um, and more gener generally, I think, it makes an enormous difference um, to claimants how, how they are actually treated by institutions. Um, the uh, French government at the moment is investigating how to measure maltreatment by institutions as one of the uh, ways in which it's measuring society's health. Ministers have emphasised the importance of lived experience recently in learning about how benefits affect people. So we need to know how claimants feel about the benefit system and whether they feel they're being treated with dignity and respect. So in conclusion, I hope in, I'm keeping to time. Um, there's a lively debate about social security at the moment across a spectrum of um, the public and uh, parties and think tanks and lobby groups and so on. I think there's quite an optimistic uh, foundation for that in terms of the um, way in which public attitudes to people on benefits were changing even before the pandemic. And the opportunity that the pandemic gives us uh, to rethink things anew. Uh, from a situation in which we have all shared to some extent the insecurity that some people feel to a much greater extent much more of the time 
there are debates from universal basic income on the one hand to a means tested minimum income guarantee on the other. And as I've already said, reinvigorating the contributory principle uh, as well. So I think we have a, a huge opportunity now to think about how to design a social security system that prevents poverty, yes, provides security, yes, and also fulfills wider aims for all of us. Thank you very much. Oh, Fran, so many questions there, but I'm conscious, um, um, for, uh, I'm conscious that uh, Lord Freud needs, can only be an hour with us, but I would love to come back to you. I love your, um, not, sorry, that's wrong. I, I particularly appreciate your remark on horizontal inequalities where you mentioned disability and families with children. And I'd love us to, to discuss the, the two children cap uh, in, in conjunction with the benefit cap, because that seems to have particularly pernicious consequences that, you know, in making families vulnerable. I mean, you know, it's something I think we we um, uh, we really need to address. But let me move on and thank you. It was really, I love the succession of principles which we will return to. So I'm delighted uh, now to turn to Helen, um, who is the director of Joseph Rowntree Foundation. And we're delighted to have their support and have her and indeed uh, her, her colleagues who've been helping us on, on previous uh, seminars. Helen, uh, over to you. You're going to talk about other aspects of the debate that, that um, uh, you as an uh, institution feel needs to be addressed and recognised. Yes, thanks very much, Philip. Brilliant to be here. Um, so I'm also going to continue this theme of insecurity because I think that there is something really fundamental about needing security in order to flourish in your life, in order to take risks, in order to feel that you can invest in your future. And I think in the last year of the pandemic, I think a lot of us have had, uh, have, have had it really brought home to us how difficult it is to function when life feels so uncertain, when we don't know what's coming around the corner and we don't know how we are gonna be able to manage those things. And that really chimes very well with what we hear from people who are caught up in poverty, the daily experience of that insecurity and uncertainty. And I think the key question for our social security system, as with our other public services, is it should be acting as a stabiliser for people in a very uncertain world. So the question is, is it doing that well enough? Now, I think it's useful to think pre-COVID, what was happening in those years leading up to the pandemic? And the really big themes of how our society was changing was we were seeing rising poverty among both workers and children. We were seeing rising homelessness. We were also seeing, particularly as Philip mentioned, deep poverty, destitution, extreme poverty, rising quite sharply in the last few years leading up to COVID. But at the same time, this was a decade where we had record employment, where we were raising the minimum wage, where we were really achieving a lot in the labour market. So I think it was what was what's been really interesting for us has been to look below the surface and say, well, what was going on? Having achieved such success, why was it not freeing people from poverty and insecurity? And I think there's two big things that we found. So the first is thinking about the labour market. So as we were getting lots of people into work. We were having very high record employment, which is fantastic. It is absolutely fundamental to an economy that's going to deliver. But what we were seeing was, although people were getting into work, the jobs were often low paid, but actually almost even more than the base rate of pay, people couldn't get enough hours to make up a decent income and low paid workers were often also insecure. So they were in jobs which were very unpredictable. So we've been working with people who week by week didn't know what shifts they would be working, what times they would need to turn up. So trying to plan family life was incredibly difficult. Trying to plan financially was difficult. And actually we were talking to people who were paying for childcare, paying for transport, then turning up and finding the shift had been canceled and they were out of pocket and had to then find a bus home and try it all again. So there was this level of insecurity in the labour market, which was holding people back and was combined with 
a lack of ability to progress. So people who were in those low paid insecure jobs, they were also in jobs where they were not getting training, they were not being invested in by their employer, they were not able to progress up to better paid, more stable work. And we had the kind of these two sides of the labour market and you couldn't leap from one to the other, from the low paid insecure bit into the more secure, better paid kind of career ladder part of the labour market. That's what's going on for people at work. What we saw at the same time was those workers who were caught up in poverty and insecurity were quite often also insecure in their own homes. Because what we look see when we see workers in poverty is they tend to be renting, not owning, and they were tending to be more and more crowded into the private rented sector because successive governments hadn't either built or retained enough low cost social homes. So people were in the private rented sector, quite often the rents were so high they were having to cut back on food and other bills in order to stave off homelessness. But because of the insecurity in that sector, they were also stuck in homes that were quite often damp, unsafe, overcrowded. And actually, quite, I remember one of the people we talked to saying, you know, I'm, I'm just one rent review away from homelessness. I'm one complaint away from homelessness because I know my landlord at any point, if I ask him to sort out the damp, he can just get us evicted. And one of the trends which I think was most striking was that the, the leading cause of the rising homelessness was people uh, ending, people having their private sector tenancies ended. So if you went back 10, 15 years, the leading cause of homelessness was family breakups. That actually was taken over and it became people who were in such insecure homes that they were ending up homeless at really very short notice, even if they were working and doing everything they could to keep up with the rent. So you have people who are caught up in this double insecurity. And it is at that point really that public services and social security are the you know, vital lifelines to be able to keep you steady. But what we saw as Fran started to say was because of the weakening of social security, because there were various cuts and freezes and changes, actually the kind of basic adequacy of that lifeline was being reduced. So just before the pandemic, we had the first ever official DWP food insecurity statistics come out. Um, and the most striking thing to me was when, we, when you look at universal credit claimants, just over four in 10 of those people were food insecure. Now that is an enormous number of people who are part of a system which should be giving them that basic lifeline, but for whom it is clearly not strong enough. And I think we saw that when COVID hit, we saw the government actually respond really quickly with the knowledge that benefit rates were not adequate and that's why they boosted them. And that has been you know, a deciding factor for a lot of families through the pandemic. Life has been incredibly tough, but it would have been so much tougher if the government hadn't acted at that moment to try and restore some of the adequacy of our benefits. So I think just to, just to conclude, I think we now, we are coming to a point, we are hopefully the kind of health crisis part of COVID is now easing. We should, you know, hopefully in four weeks time be moving out of the last of the restrictions. So we are at the stage of crafting a recovery. And I think for me, one of the most important things is that we do not make the same mistakes as I think we made after our la after the Great Recession. So there were kind of three mistakes I think that we made that we now have a chance to learn from. The first is that we do need to focus on the quality of work, not just the quantity of jobs. So we need to have a good jobs recovery so that as we get people back into work as quickly as possible, we get them into jobs which will give them the security which we all know a working life should bring you. Similarly with housing, we need to make sure we build more and we keep hold of more of our low cost social rented homes so that those people who are on very low incomes and are in this labour market insecurity are not also facing insecurity at home and the spectre of homelessness. And then a final thing I think is that we, we can see that actually investing in social security, it is one of the basic things you have to do to give people an adequate basis for their life, which they can then build on, which they can take opportunities from. But when we have so many people who are food insecure, who are getting into debt because they can't keep up with the bills, who are cutting back on food to make the rent, that is not a basis for a thriving society. It's not a basis for people to have a springboard 
to take risks, to take opportunities. So I think we, ha we have a real opportunity now to make sure that we build on the, some of the restoration of social security that we saw during the pandemic. And we make sure that lifeline stays strong for people who are gonna need it through the recovery. I'll stop there because I obviously want to hear from both Stephen and Lord Freud. So thank you very much. Thank you um, so much, Helen. I think I'm, I'm in deep agreement with you um, about the fact that our, our system is, is still failing. And I think the remarks that really resonate for me is at a time of great growth, you know, huge, massive, mass, almost full employment, unprecedented rises in, in the statutory kind of wage, um, almost to living wage levels, um, we still have this rise in deep poverty and insecurity and, and the percentage of children from earlier seminars that are in poverty is highest for those in, in families where somebody's working. So work still doesn't pay for far too many. And that, that's really kind of the import I take from, from, from your remarks along with others. But over to um, Lord Freud, and um, we're very grateful to him for joining us because unfortunately Tom Tugendhat had to withdraw as the Armed Forces Bill is going through Parliament uh, and, and he needs to speak on it. Um, but it's, it's, it's providential because um, um, David was involved in the philosophy, the design, the implementation of the universal credit system, which is our, our current uh, mainstay, if I can put it like that, of our social security system. And he has also written a book on the struggles uh, to realize uh, the aims, the intentions, the hopes, and the aspirations of universal credit. And I, I knew many, knew and know many of the people involved and uh, and I'm very sympathetic to those who are working at the DWP, who are constantly torpedoed by the Treasury and uh, who constantly demanded that if they give with one hand, more must be taken back with the other. But I, I now encroach upon David's territory. De uh, Lord Freud, over to you. We, I'd love to hear about the principles of universal credit, what it would hope to do, what limited it. And I think most importantly, what you would do to reform the system as it is, what you think it needs in the light of the comments of, of both Helen and Fran. Over to you, Lord Freud. Thanks very much, Philip. Um, I mean, the first thing I want to start with by, is, is simply by saying uh, universe credit is here to stay. And, and the reason for that is pretty simple. It is so difficult to uh, uh, build a new system that no one else is going to try and do it. So whatever you, whatever you think about universal credit, that's the system. Uh, and, we're, and we're stuck with that for years, you know, probably for the next 50 years. And if you want to know how difficult it is, I'll do a bit of marketing. Why not? Uh, you know, uh, clashing agendas, I called it, just because it was the most horrific process you can dream of. And it was horrific because it's very, very complicated and very, very political. Um, the, the only design, new design concept that I can see that people are talking about, which one could uh, go around, is um, uh, UBI, um, um, Universal Basic Income. And I, 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 I completely baffled by that one. I think it's, it's uh, uh, you know, simplify. I think it's an oversimplistic uh, solution looking for a problem. Uh, a, it's going to be very expensive. Uh, B, it's counter to all the active labour market policies. Uh, it'll basically encourage young people not to get into, into the market. And the amount of money will not be a, 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 anything like enough uh, to help the people who really, really need it, the disabled and, and the truly vulnerable. So I don't get that one at all. I don't, I don't think it's got, I don't think it'll have legs. Um, universal credit is basically uh, an engine and you can do what you like with it. Uh, you can put more money in, you can put less money in. The, the, um, the, the, the principle about it, the best thing about it is very well targeted to the people who need it most. Uh, unlike the old legacy systems where, you know, uh, at the extreme, 
uh, you could be earning £85,000 a year and still get tax credits. So that was, that was the, the figure that I worked out once. Uh, and, and in concept, it's just basically a safety net for every citizen in this country uh, when they fall on hard times. And the rates um, that they get are tailored to their needs, which of course means uh, that they're means tested. I mean, you can't do that system without, without having it means tested. Now, the trouble was there were massive, massive cuts to welfare going in at exactly the same time. So um, George Osborne claimed that in the coalition years, he got 21 billion now. I don't think it was quite as bad as that because people snuck in and got it back in different ways. And then he targeted another 12 billion a year uh, in 2015. And a, a lot of the attacks on UC and the confusion is basically uh, um, conflating the two things. They happened at the same time. They are very different processes. Um, if I could just say about UC, I mean, the big thing about it is that it does work. I mean, luckily, uh, it was digital at the time when, um, if it hadn't been digital, and a lot of people complained about that, uh, we would we would have had the most ghastly uh, uh, experience uh, in the spring of last year, when 1.8 million people uh, uh, wanted to to go on the system, and I can tell you that um, uh, just, you know, we, that would have just fallen over. It, was, it would have been curtains for our legacy system. Um, so it's in, it works. The issue is uh, once it is in, uh, my view is that it offers the most amazing opportunity to build on. I mean, it's just a base to be built on. And I think that's what's so interesting about it in a way that it is not possible to build on the hodgepodge legacy system. So, I mean, and, 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 and clearly, I mean, you know, the central concept where it came from, from my perspective, I think it more or less, more than anyone else, Roy, Roy Sainsbury at, at York University was the one who remember him coming into my room once and slapping me about saying, just, it's one benefit, just do it, he said. Um, and it is one benefit, it, it, but it's, and it's very flexible. Um, and, and the reason for that is it doesn't work by categorization. I think virtually every other um, benefit system in the world works by saying, oh, you're disabled, go over there. Oh, you're a single mother, go over there. Uh, oh, you've got this, you've got that, you know. So they categorize you and, and, and then you can't get out of that categorization. Uh, because if you if you do, you have to make it in one jump. Oh, I'm no longer disabled. Uh, but you don't get into a good paying job straight away from that. But you've lost your benefits, so you don't do it. And that's what the welfare track is about. If you have these very, uh, you know, categorizing systems. And I think that is the greatest thing about Univers Credit is that it doesn't categorize people. They can change how they behave and it just acts quite smoothly as they change behavior. Um, now, um, clearly, um, you know, the issue is around the cuts that have come in and, and to what extent they can be and should be reversed. I mean, my own view is I hated virtually all of them. Um, you know, it's going to be very expensive to reverse them. So one's going to have to have um, mega battles with the treasury to try and reverse some of these cuts. And we can all name the ones we hate most. Um, um, and, um, you know, but that is, that is about money. Um, I mean, my, my big one is I spent literally years trying to get the first payment as people got onto it uh, to be a grant for a fortnight. And in the end, I had to create it as a loan, which, you know, works to some extent, but uh, it would have been much smoother as a grant rather than the kind of housing run-ons and disability runs on ons and the and the way they've done it. Um, now it needs to be completed. Clearly, the, the, the next big test for universal credit is the migration process, and which is due to be completed by uh, 2024, although given the history, you know, one would not be surprised if that uh, strayed a little bit later. Um, but then 
uh, having got it in and got everyone on it, I think there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, the first one, I think, is just the sheer research opportunity. Uh, you know, you have got, you can, uh, I put in the legislation, the ability to make variations in, uh, in, in all the aspects of universal credit. So you could take uh, control groups, test them out. What happens if you change the taper to 60%, 55%? What happens if you have a, a second earner work, work allowance? What happens if you do that? And you can test all these things. And more importantly, you can measure the effects very cheaply because you can see what people are doing in terms of their earnings. You, you've got that feed every month. So you can do an enormous amount of fine tuning of the system um, um, with, with, with proper research. Again, I don't think any other country uh, anywhere else has been able to even dream of doing something like that. So I think that's the big opportunity. Uh, the next thing, I think, the first thing that I would spend a lot of time, money and effort on is uh, worrying about the most vulnerable. I mean, the, the people, at the, you know, say 20, roughly 20 percent, I'd guess, uh, who, you know, really can't handle life or universal credit or anything, you know, without support. And I developed um, the, the, the beginnings of the concept called universal support. And the idea there is quite simple. You, um, you try and help people round because they've got multiple problems. And when people have got multiple problems, they need to be taken round uh, all the uh, uh, sources of support that there are. We actually do have a lot of support around. The trouble is <clears throat> we use it very inefficiently. So um, going to where uh, all these um, resources are, and I'm thinking about this citizens advice, there's the housing department, there's the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the credit union in a hub, and there are now increasing numbers of hubs, uh, DWP there as well, uh, and then steering them round, caseworker, that we haven't invested in, so that would be the new investment, data management so we know where people have gone. There is actually uh, hidden away in their legislation, which I know I've put in, to allow one to go through so that you don't have to start all over again every time you see a new, uh, a new supporter. Uh, you might do that with an electronic wallet. I think that was the most promising single idea to help the most vulnerable in this country. Uh, and I think we discovered that you need to get all these resources in one place. I think we first discovered it, the housing minister in the Second World War, when people were being bombed in the East End, he worked it out. Uh, I, I know we forget it all the time. If we did that, we would help people. Um, productivity. I mean, the, I mean this, this is the stuff that, that Helen was talking about, you know, all these jobs. How do we help people? Again, Universal credit <clears throat> looks after low paid people as well as unemployed people. And in other words, the DWP or their agents are interpolating themselves uh, into that situation. Again, for the first time, I mean, the HMRC never worried about low paid tax credits people. So we, we can uh, start to support the low paid, um, and that's got to be in the end about upskilling and training. Uh, and again, I've always been baffled why in this country, the employment minister sits in the DWP and the training um, people, well, they've been wandering around. They were with employment for a bit. They moved to, um, they moved, they've moved back and forth. Um, so having training and skills as part of the agenda for the low paid, with the people who are driving them would be a no brainer to me and would start to address Helen's issue about how do we get a process of upskilling people so they're paid decently. Um, and likewise, the self-employed. I mean, we've got, I forget, I think the figure's around 4 million self-employed. A lot of them are living, at, you know, at a wretched level of, uh, of subsistence. And again, uh, I've put in a system, which I don't know how much it's grown now in DWP, where you start to support the low paid self-employed just the same. 
and you understand what the issues are about being self-employed. Again, it's a lot of it is how do you run your business more efficiently? A little business maybe, but how do you do it so that you make money? And then I think my number one priority uh, is sorting out uh, the disabled, sorting out uh, proper support for the disabled. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, we try to do that. Stephen will no doubt be able to talk about that in a minute. Uh, we try to do that. It, it, what we found is it was very expensive because there was very limited overlap between uh, PIP and the disability uh, element, people on the disability elements in UC. But clearly, you know, a single test uh, would be invaluable for them. Uh, the idea that you were owed a supplement because you were disadvantaged in the labor market, not because you can't work in the labor market, would really be transformative for their ability to do some work and more work in the months where they weren't, uh, you know, uh, it, it, certainly if they got intermittent conditions, uh, able to work freely or not without endangering uh, their payments. So I think there's an enormous amount to do. And I think um, in the mid twenties, um, somebody, I hope, um, Stephen, I'm looking at you now, uh, will get in and start kicking this agenda about using the system that we've got. I'm out of time. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lord Boyd. That was, that was um, fantastic. One of the things that um, you didn't mention was the benefit cap that I mentioned to, to Fran and the two children benefit cap. What's your thought on that? Um, I remember being utterly shocked when I saw the benefit cap introduced by George Osborne and, um, and then Ian coming to me and saying, sorry, David, uh, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to, uh, uh, you know, own it. And by the way, you're introducing it. So, you know, thanks very much. I think something rather similar uh, with the two child thing, which was ghastly, uh, you know, with all these, uh, I had to do all, all this stuff on, 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 on rape, uh, you know, differentiation. I mean, you know, it is a ghastly, uh, just in practicality, this is just practicalities in complexity. Um, uh, I'd be very interested to see if it has had any behavioural impact, because clearly that was one of the reasons behind it, any behavioural impact whatsoever in terms of uh, larger families from poorer people. I doubt it profoundly. Uh, but I, that, again, you know, I've got a long list of cuts that I, I would want to reverse, uh, and, I'm, and those, are, those are two of them. Thank you very much. We've got some... Um questions uh, to you and I, I'd like to ask the audience do do flag please uh, because David's going to have to leave us uh, shortly. Helen uh, you very kindly you wanted to ask a question of Lord Boyd. Um, yeah the thing I was interested in is obviously one of the great things about universal credit is that it will kind of cover people as they move in and out of work it's responsive to change in circumstances but I think in the last few years one of things that I think we've seen is that has it, has it become too responsive? So it's actually kind of exaggerating the instability people have in work as their wages go up and down. So is there, do you think it is time to think about kind of a slightly less responsive version so it acts as a stabilizer? I mean, I mean, you said, you know, clearly universal credit goes up and down, but it only goes up and down to the extent that your earnings go up and down. So your actual income every month uh, stays pretty stable so that's that's the that's the issue it reflects your earnings so I think that works um, it, it may be that um, you know that the matter uh, you know the matter of, 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 of uh, is not many weeks of, of difference between when you put in your amount and you get your money a week later so it may be that some people find it difficult to handle they got a lot of money in their income and they spent it all straight away and then their you know, credit was reduced. But I can't imagine um, that most people would be hit by that. And I think one of the issues uh, is that the important thing about a welfare system, and that is how we designed it, is that it is simple. So people understand those concepts. You know, anyone can understand, you know, I'm going to have this amount of money in total to live on this month. The trouble is every time the treasury puts in 
a money saving device, it complicates it and it makes it less easy for people to understand how the system works. So I think that might be the reason that there's a problem. I don't think it's in the design of, of, of the fluctuations. Fran, your thoughts on universal um, credit. I mean, what's interesting about David is essentially a great supporter because it, it essentially, I mean, one of the arguments we haven't mentioned is it, it's part of an active labor market policy. It, it encourages you to increase your income and work. And the sense that, that, that it, it's an engine and it can deliver more and we're very clear on David's opinion of, of the cuts, um, some of which is deeply pernicious, I think. What would your thoughts, would you largely agree with Lord Freud on, on the fact universal credit works, it just needs more? Or, or are there any anything you would like to add to it? You need to unmute, Fran. Unmute. Don't worry. Yeah. Do you know that's the first time I've ever done that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I I can see the <clears throat> I can see the attractiveness of of not categorising, and the fact that. Um, People are often on the borderline between, for example, uh, unemployed and uh, not able to work, or as David said, uh, disabled but can work a bit. Um, although I have to say there was a disabled addition in terms of uh, working tax credit to recognise that. Um, however, um, uh, so I can see some of those attractive features. Um, I suppose in response to the, the sort of three things that have been raised, one is that um, in work support and conditionality is is not yet working really. Um, so um, the government is not quite sure how best to do it. And to be fair, they're trying to find out before they implement it. So we can't really see yet whether that is working. The only people, as I understand it, who are meant to be subject to conditionality who are already employed are those people who are working below the administrative earnings threshold, which basically means they would have been treated as unemployed in the previous system. So, um, that, so we don't yet know about in-work conditionality and we don't yet know about in-work support. And other countries haven't done it, as I think David would acknowledge. So um, it, it, it's, a, it's an unknown quantity. Let's, let's see how it works. Um, the other two things which are, I think he's absolutely right about saying that we shouldn't muddle up the structure of universal credit and its design versus the cuts in social security. And that's absolutely right. Uh, and I hope I don't do that. But I do have two concerns about the design. One is this monthly reassessment, which I think is more of a problem than Lord Freud is, is saying it is. Um, because of the monthly reassessment and the way in which that does or doesn't uh, articulate with uh, when people are paid. Um, so you may well have, um, if you've got a couple, for example, both of whom are earning, uh, and one of them is paid paid weekly and the other is paid for weekly, um, it can actually do a complete nightmare with how your universal credit fluctuates. And yes, it does fluctuate in relation to earnings, Lord Freud, but it fluctuates in relation to what has been received within that particular monthly assessment period. And similarly, if your circumstances change, for example, if you um, have a baby the day before your assessment period ends, you'll get a whole month's extra money for that baby. If the baby is born uh, the day after, then you won't. So it very much, and similarly, if you change um, uh, housing and you have to have, uh, and you're paying um, less or more housing costs, it treats you as though that's been the case for the whole month. So it's the monthly assessment that is a structural issue, I think, that we need to think about. And the other, the other thing we need to think about, just briefly, is integrating for everybody. Can you see any downsides for that as well as upsides? OK, I want to also bring in Stephen and then uh, Lord Freud can answer both questions. Stephen, you had a question for Lord Freud. Yeah, Philip, thank you very much. And it's fascinating uh, listening to David because David and I worked together for a period at, at, at DWP and he will remember those battles with the, the Treasury and the, the sheer scepticism that there was within the Treasury about universal credit. They seem to absolutely hate it. 
and only really warmed up and became enthusiastic to any degree about rolling it out when they realized actually it could be used as effectively a cuts delivery device. So the faster you roll it out, the quicker you are embedding cuts into, into the system. And um, I mean, I, I remember those discussions with ministers and officials then, and, and their view was all of this stuff around universal support, active labor mod policies, very skeptical about that. Their view was that you, know, you get people back into the labor market by bearing down on welfare spending, finding ever more clever ways to cap benefits and restrict eligibility and apply conditionality. Uh, and just take a really, really tough approach. And, and so my question to you is kind of looking back, you know, five years on, um, David, you know, has, has the Treasury been proved correct in any of their analysis? Or, or are we still secure in actually believing that, that, that they are taking a fundamentally wrongheaded philosophical approach to this and that all of our instincts that we had back in that department then were correct? I, um, I despise the Treasury, actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I despise it for a very good reason. I, we ended up with a, a two, two times a year spreadsheet round where they had their spreadsheets and they had, uh, they had a turnover. The turnover of the treasury was 25% and they were 29 years old. And their job was to squeeze departments with, and they would go with a spreadsheet and say, if we take this line out, take that line out, uh, you know, I can get this spreadsheet to do this. And they had no idea or um, knowledge really of what the impacts, the behavioral impacts might be of doing those changes. So, uh, and they didn't care because once they had delivered that spreadsheet, they were probably going to obtain changed jobs. Uh, so it was a deeply uh, invidious process and a wrong headed process for how one might reform the system. So we were getting into a really complicated, I can't tell you how complicated, well, you know how complicated, um, sit, uh, you know, uh, rebuild of the system. And you, where you're trying to balance the incentives, the way people might respond, uh, and, and the whole the whole way of life for these people. It wasn't about you know the pound shillings and pence. It was about you know it was psychology, their lives. How do you get them rethinking? Um, uh, how do you get them to feel secure? I mean, you know, <laughs> Helen's Helen and Fran's point. So this was a, this is a terrible process that we went through these cuts. And I think they did not work. I mean, one of the uh, one of the most interesting things was when um, uh, you know they started squeezing and squeezing. They found, to their surprise, that PIP was going up. Everyone was putting uh, they wanted extra PIP. Uh, surprise, surprise, because they couldn't get it here, so they would get it there. So they would start playing. And then, of course, we had the explosion <laughs> from your immediate predecessor, Ian. Uh, you know, as, as, as one, one change after the, the other. So the whole thing was invidious. And, and, and my view is you can reduce the cost of benefit um, and welfare, but it is a really subtle long-term process of how you design the system. And, um, and having people swinging in uh, you know, through the trees with their spreadsheet cuts was deeply unhelpful to that process. Wanna just quickly answer any of Fran's uh, questions? You probably you Yeah, I have to yes, I have to run. Well, I think Fran um, you know, has got issue has has put the her finger on on on, on some of what I would call uh, niggles in the system which probably are sortable in, and I, I, I mentioned spending quite a lot of time on some of this, but you know, you are moving with these people from a system where you did an assessment once a year and where people were building up massive debts, which the treasury are now trying to get back again through universal credit. Um, so you're kind of moving from the, um, from a situation where you have the ludicrous to, 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 to something where you have some specific niggly problems because you're doing it on a monthly basis, but they're much less of a problem um, than, um, than the annual. And the other thing I, I would say is that 
and I talked to a lot of employers and everyone else, um, people, the, the fact that universal credit is on a monthly basis will push the whole of the country, uh, all employers, I think, onto monthly in the, in, in, in the times to come. And I talked to a lot of them who said, some said, oh, I pay weekly. And then others in the same event management, this would be, I would say, well, I just do it monthly anyway, and you should as well, you know. So I think that is a problem, A, which can be dealt with in, in, with specific, uh, you know, fiddling around just to, 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 to optimize, but also I think the underlying trend will get rid of a lot of the problem. Thank you so much, David. I realize you have to go. We're greatly appreciative. Do you want to just show everybody your new book? Yes, I'll show it again. You know, you, 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 we're not the BBC, are we? But I mean, this okay. will give some of you nightmares when you read it, I can assure you, because uh, you will see uh, the most horrific process. And, and, I, and I wrote a, a section of three chapters, which I call Cuts. And I almost got post-traumatic stress as I wrote them. It was just so horrible. Um, but there we are. Okay. I have to run. Bye now. Appreciate Good it. See you all. We'll send you a video of the event. Um, and uh, it's a great honor and pleasure now to turn uh, to Stephen Crabb, who is really has been holding the torch uh, for rethinking the social security system and for generating the policy ideas that conservatives should. Uh, enact and we're enormously grateful to him for for joining us so over to you Stephen um, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts thank you very much Philip it's a real pleasure to join the panel this afternoon that was fascinating uh, hearing the the previous three speakers um I, I guess the argument I want to make this afternoon is a fairly simple and straightforward one around the importance I believe of having a social security system which is fair which is clearly understood and which is adequately funded. And one of the things that particularly motivates me at the moment is a desire to see a much greater, stronger political consensus around such a system, a system that strikes the right balance when it comes to rights, obligations, eligibility and conditionality and about funding levels. And that's really at the heart of the argument I want to make. But I want to speak from the point of view of the discussions that are happening in, within the Conservative Party and perhaps offer some insights into where the different strands of cons conservative thought are at because Fran is exactly right there are lots of discussions happening in different places about uh, social security and welfare in its broadest sense at the moment on the back of the the pandemic um, and there are discussions within the conservative party as well and a lot of those are very very positive and constructive uh, one thing we come up time and time again and I'd like to start with this is that you know, somewhere deep within the, the, uh, the hard wiring of the conservative psyche is this view that spending on benefits is highly questionable, if not downright dangerous. And it's a point of view that comes to the fore when we're discussing poverty. And the, the way it currently gets articulated goes something like this. Social security is incredibly costly. Funding it requires large amounts of taxation or spending cuts elsewhere. It seems to make very little difference to overall poverty levels. It builds no schools or railways or other wealth creating infrastructure. It does not level up between regions or communities and perhaps crucially delivers no political benefit whatsoever since people of working age who receive welfare payments overwhelmingly choose not to vote for us. That is a pretty mainstream conservative take on benefit spending. And it's shared by even you know, very, very sensible, pragmatic conservatives who hold to one nation or social justice value. That is a point of view that gets aired uh, frequently in the discussions that have been going on. And behind this general suspicion and unease is the concern that far from being a thing that helps get people through hard times, somehow benefits actually risk make, making things worse for, for claimants and certainly for society as a whole, because Welfare undermines the work ethic and work is, of course, the essential core of the Conservative Party message on tackling po poverty. And yet furthermore, decades of, of spending on benefits are perceived to have undermined traditional family structures, voluntarism, personal responsibility. I could go on, but you get the idea, a pretty bleak picture lurking in the background. And my message today isn't to dismiss all of that, because I think actually the left has been wrong to overlook 
some of what underpins those concerns around welfare. But I do think from the perspective of my own party, from the centre right, that uh, we do need to take an evidence led approach and for us to get over what I think is something of a blind spot when it comes to working age benefits and to recognise that adequately funded social security plays a really important role in protecting individuals and families against poverty and supporting people into work. So one of the most frequent comments that I hear from Conservative colleagues when we discuss uh, poverty relates to where is public opinion on all of this? And there's an assumption that there is an outright public hostility towards spending on benefits. Now, that's certainly true. Um, if you go back and look from the late 90s, early 2000s onwards, there was a dramatic hardening of public opinion around benefits. You look at all the British social attitude surveys and the other polls, and the strong message that comes through time and time again is that people, rightly or wrongly, were thinking benefits are too generous and they're basically unfair. And that's a view that still shapes a lot of um, thought within my party around benefit. But I, I would suggest that it's a little outdated because if you look at the more recent opinion surveys that have been done, there's a really interesting and really quite significant change in what the public are thinking and saying. So, for example, taken from the British Social Attitude Survey, more members of the public now seem to agree with the proposition that benefits are too low and cause hardship than those who believe that benefit levels are too high and discourage work. And uh, for the first time in 25 years, more people say they disagree with the proposition that if welfare benefits weren't so generous, then people would learn to stand on their own two feet. There's a, more people disagree with that than agree with that. And that's really quite a significant shift. And there are certainly still sharp differences in how people who identify as conservatives will answer those questions compared with people who identify with other parties. But opinion is certainly shifting. But this, this political dividing line, um, it is one that some are keen to exploit. Um, they see it as a useful tool for us electorally come election time. Uh, but I personally think that using benefits as a wedge issue is unhelpful and actually creates a real barrier to a more rational evidence-led debate about what fair and adequate social security should look like. And in any case, it gets a lot more interesting too when you start to consider where my party is now pitching for votes. As the conservative voter base has shifted deeper into lower income areas, this whole issue becomes politically much more important for us. So the last election, 2019, nine out of the 50 parliamentary constituencies containing the largest proportion of working age benefit claimants voted for a Conservative MP. Now that might not sound a lot, nine out of 50, but bear in mind in 2010, there were just three. And these are constituencies where around 35, 40% of the working age pop population are claiming some kind of benefits from the DTWP. Look, to me, that, that we are competitive, that the Conservative Party is competitive in any of those seats is a, is a remarkable thing. Now, now is not the, uh, the time to unpick why there's been this shift towards uh, the Conservative Party in areas with larger numbers of people on low incomes. We could have a whole day conference on that. But my basic point is that politically, the Conservative Party now has a more direct interest in getting its message and, and policies balanced correctly when it comes to support for working age families. Which brings me to my next point, which is about the need to break the stubborn perception that persists my party, wider society as well, that our system of benefits is overly generous and incentivizes people not to work. In no way can UK social security be described as generous. Uh, but this is still a view which influences conservative discussions around welfare and poverty. It came up again just a few days ago in a, a meeting I was at with some colleagues where we were talking about skill shortages and the fact that employers up and down the country are currently reporting enormous recruitment difficulties. Uh, and social security was once again being held up as the villain in, in the story. If only benefits weren't so generous, the people wouldn't be sat at home on the sofa when employers are crying out for more staff to come forward. That is a very, very strong perception that continues to influence 
um, discussion within the party. But I, I'll just bring in a quote from Paul Johnson of the IFS here. He wrote recently, our benefit system is much less generous than that of many other advanced economies. For average earners, replacement rates, the fraction of earnings that the benefit system replaces are astonishingly low, only 13% for single people and 20% for couples against international averages of above 50% for many. Repeat again, the UK social security system is not generous. And one, one of the reasons, of course, we can say with confidence that benefits are far from generous, and we've spent a fair bit of time talking about it already this afternoon, is that those deliberate set of decisions that were taken, first of all in 2010, then again in 2015, after the election then, to embark on a programme of real-term spending cuts within the benefit system. Um, it was a very deliberate decision that was taken, particularly the cuts that came in after 2015. Uh, there was a deliberate political dividing line that uh, we sought to, to utilise politically. Uh, the Labour Party were very sensitive to this, and they also at that same time were trying to sound tougher on Social Security. If you look when Rachel Reeves became Shadow Work and Pension Secretary in 2013, her first speeches were all about um, making things tougher for benefit claimants and those who quote, linger on benefits. It was very much a theme of the day, how to make the system tougher. But the, the fruits that we're living with today, we, we've talked about it this afternoon, are those very deep cuts that people on low incomes have experienced uh, over the last five years. And, and, and that understanding, that crucial bit of data, I think is really important for understanding the current picture when it comes to poverty levels in the UK. At the same time that we were doing that, we were sticking rigidly, as we still are, to the triple lock pension formula that's boosted pensioner incomes year on year, a deliberate political choice, more resources for those in retirement, squeeze resources for working age families. And I think this is fundamentally the issue that any Conservative wanting to talk about poverty in 2021 needs to address. It is the elephant in the room. The theory back in 2005, or at least the, the, the defensive lines that we were given to use in the media when we were ministers back then was that look, the labour market creating hundreds of thousands of new jobs and we were seeing you know huge improvements in the labour market. The pay boost that we were given, giving through increasing the minimum wage, the raising of the income tax personal allowances, we were effectively rewriting the equation, making work far more attractive. We would see real terms, wage increases, and we would be celebrating a virtuous stories of fewer children growing up in households where no one works, greater take home pay, all of that. As we rolled out universal credit, we would be seeing all around us proof that work truly is the best route out of poverty, that the core of the message, I repeat, the core of the message for conservatives about poverty. But that's not what happened. Uh, and instead, has already been talked about this afternoon, we saw a growth in in work poverty. More people than ever before in our history going out to work every day, but not resulting in any significant change to levels of poverty. And I would suggest um, this afternoon that that, as conservatives, profoundly trouble us, uh, the, the increase in in work poverty, especially when we have placed low income workers at the heart of our political message. Um, during the recent discussions that we had around the £20 universal credit uplift, it came as something of a surprise to many of my colleagues to learn that more than 30% of all the people claiming universal credit are actually in work. So, you know, if we say that we're on the side of people striving on low pay, if we make low income workers a kind of an archetypal key political cause, then cutting back on universal credit, which is effectively what we're planning to do now in November with the £20 uplift, directly hurts those people, directly hurts their monthly in income. And it's, and it's amazing how difficult it's been to land this point in political discussions or in the press, uh, where this persists this view that benefits equals people staying at home uh, versus work, the noble right decision um, and, and it's either one or the other. It's far more complicated than that. So look, just in, in conclusion, I come back to my punchline, which is about the importance of adequate, predictable social security as a, as a vital cornerstone in any government's fight against poverty. What was dismaying for me about some of the, the, the row over the £20 uplift was the, um, what it highlighted was a, I, I felt a kind of a real paucity in the, in the quality of arguments internally within government and, and my party about social security 
ministers in public refusing to acknowledge that the £20 uplift was to address inadequate out-of-work benefits as claimant numbers surged. Uh, when pressed in private, ministers couldn't actually explain what they felt the £20 uplift was there for um, and weren't ready to acknowledge that cutting it back would cause direct hardship to families. And I think there's a lot of work to do. It is a key moment, I agree with Fran on that, to, for rethinking the welfare state. But there's a lot of work just to get some, so some basic understandings across, I think, uh, and to address one question which seems to cause a lot of problem every time I bring Conservatives together to talk about this, which is what actually do we want the social security system to do? And what do we regard as an adequate level of funding uh, and levels of, of, of different benefits? So I'll leave it there. I'm happy to take questions, but I thought I'd offer those thoughts from, from within, the, within the Conservative Party right now. My, uh, I'm very grateful for this. Um, Stephen, can I ask you, first of all, what you would do in terms of policy response to, to, to speak to this? Would you increase the amount of money going in? What, what, what is your policy response that we could engender uh, that could speak to this? Secondly, uh, Mike, could you bring in the three questions? Um, my small, my three-year-old downstairs is is uh, demanding my presence. I shall shortly uh, come back to to your bed. So, Stephen, could you give us some policy ideas, and then Mike, could you please bring on first of all Mark and the other questioners, ask them to ask their questions, and then I'd like all panelists to choose which one to ask. I'll be with you shortly. Thank you. So, so Stephen, uh, yeah. Thanks, Philip. So I, I absolutely do believe in the need for um, better funding of, of the social secur security system. And in saying that, there is an admission there, as we've been talking about this afternoon, that the cuts, and I was part of the government at the time, so I share in the decisions that were taken, um, uh, was, was the wrong choice. And as I've tried to allude to, they were a lot of that was politically driven and driven by some some flawed assumptions about about benefits and um that that has caused hardship and so i think there's definitely a need to revisit some of those specific choices i mean 20 pound uplift absolute no-brainer in my view um uh, you, you one thing that every previous work and pensions minister would say is that that they've learned is that you know, if you've if you've increased a benefit you cannot then take it away from people. You can cancel planned increases. You can freeze benefits. Uh, they're polit that's politically more acceptable. It's actually really quite a tough thing to do once you've given families on the lowest incomes uh, a a an increase in their take in their pay in their incomes to then take that away. That's that's pretty harsh. So, twenty pound uplift. Let's not spend too much time talking about that. I think that it should be made permanent. Uh, I think we ought to then revisit. Um, some of those uh, policies that are still in place around um, around capping. I thought the the point that um, David Freud touched on around work and health is a really important one because uh, previous Labour governments, previous iterations of the coalition and the Conservative government have tried to really address the the the, the big increase in spending on benefits for people who effectively fall out of the labour market due to reasons of sickness and poor health and we we've not really been able to to come up with meaningful strategies for tackling that and one of the things that really concerned me when i was at dwp five years ago was when you asked for what does the data show what what evidence have we have we learned about what works when helping people um uh, stay close to the labor market if they're suffering from poor mental health or from uh, recovering from injuries and things um it was just a shack at sheer lack of hard evidence that officials could point to to say what worked or didn't work. Um, and, I, and I think there's a big area of work in terms of looking forward to a next generation of welfare reform. Um, there's a big area of work to do around work and health. Okay, um, wonderful, thank you. And um, can we now turn to, I'm going to ask the questions I've identified. I'd like panelists to choose which ones to respond and then I think that will take us to our time. So first of all, uh, actually it's my colleague, Mark Morin. Mark, can you come on and demute and ask your question, please? Hi, Philip, can you hear me? 
yeah, we can. Go ahead. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so I'll just straightforwardly read it. Um, given that in-work poverty has been rising, uh, as indeed uh, insecurity in the labour market uh, and, and indeed the structural changes in the labour market have been changing, what does this mean now for the future of active labour market policies? What does it mean for DWP and JCP employment programmes so that we can encourage and improve retention and advancement in, in the labour market. Should these, should these programmes, if they exist at all, um, be situated within, within the remit of DWP and JCP? Thank you very much, Mark. Now, uh, Ying Jin, please. Um, uh, thank you, Philip. And uh, I have a, a quick question about um, uh, training upskilling. Um, Basically, um, to uh, to look at uh, social security and then work, and then inevitably, one would touch on this question. Um, I would like to have um, a panel member uh, to see whether they have any thoughts about uh, what are the most productive um, training programs that could work um, with uh, your ideal uh, social security systems. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have um, an interesting sub-question to that by Chris Hollins, who asked, could the variations allowed by universal credit be used by cities to tailor the system um, to their local needs? So I think it's an interesting question. Now we have Ed uh, Pybus, please. Ed, can you come on, please? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yep. Excellent. Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Ed Paris. I'm from the Child Poverty Action Group um, up in Scotland. And obviously have, um, we have great concerns that um, the social security system isn't lifting people out of poverty, um, as, as do all the panels seem to share that concern. Um, I was interested in it when, when Fran sort of delineated the, um, the four roles of social security, uh, the insurance, prevention, relief for poverty, um, inequality, smooth out incomes. Um, but it seems to be that there's a fifth role that social security tries to do, which is shape individuals' behaviour, whether that's around um, uh, active work policies or conditionality or two-child limit. Um, and so how much does trying to shoehorn this fifth role into the social security system cause these problems that means that um, social security can't fulfill its, its four roles that it, um, that it should have. Thank you very much, uh, Ed. Uh, very, very grateful. There's been an additional question to that that Jeff Knotts uh, asked, uh, and it's about, um, is there a programme of constant improvement? Uh, what can we do, RE, savings and efficiency? Could they be put back into UC benefits, etc.? So what I'm going to do is, it, as panellists, you can't answer them all. So I'd like you to select uh, a, a question or possibly two that you'd like to give a brief answer to. So if I'll go to Helen first, if I may. Helen. Um, so I think, they're, I think they're great questions. I think they're actually linked. So just thinking about the um, in-work progression and also the employment and skills stuff, because I think they're linked. So I think there are, two, there are basically two bits to what we need. The first is that actually for quite a lot of people, the kind of mainstream Job Centre Plus work coach offer actually works pretty well. People come out of work, they're not out of work for that long. They need a bit of support and they go back in. Um, and it's got fair, it, it's, it's actually working all right. What I think we haven't got yet is a model which really um, delivers on the quality of jobs and progression. And there is much less evidence of how you do that. But internationally, what the evidence does suggest is essentially it is best to look at a kind of city region level or a combined authority type level. And what you need is an employment and skills system, which is driven by the kind of economic strategy for that area in which job, good quality jobs are being prioritised. And then you construct employment support and skills programmes around the opportunities that are being created and the people that need them. And that that's how you kind of get this integrated system. Now to do that, we probably need two things. One is to devolve quite a lot more down to city region level so that combined authorities and mayors where they exist can have a coherent strategy. The other is that the kind of national framework needs to enable it. So there's one you know, obvious thing at the moment, you've got one bit of government that says, we're gonna have a right to get a level three qualification. 
which is vital if we want to upskill people. But actually, everyone knows it takes more than eight to 12 weeks to get most level threes. If you are on universal credit or other benefits, you haven't got the flexibility to take the time to do that qualification, which the government wants you to do, which will get you into a better job. So we have this misalignment. So we need to realign DWP and universal credit to support upskilling and wait, holding out for better quality jobs. I think, I think if I may, Helen, I think that's a very apposite response. Um, we at Res Publica are running with Chris Skidmore MP, Lifelong Education Commission, that is looking at precisely creating um, upskilling and training opportunities for the entire population above and beyond the current government's white paper, which focuses on qualifications, we're looking at skill acquisition. And Doncaster Metropolitan Borough Council have just joined the commission and are, with, with colleagues in the area, are backing a report to try and create exactly the system that, that you've described. So we really should get the JRIF and your good self involved in it. So I'll, I'll let you know, uh, but thank you for that fabulous response. Fran, any of the questions you would like to uh, address or answer? Yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to um, uh, talk about in-work poverty a little bit and just um, the shaping individual behaviour. So in-work poverty rising, um, I think uh, there are a lot of different policy areas that fit into the idea of doing something about in-work poverty. So the questioner talked about active labour market policies and uh, job centre and so on. And Helen has uh, has has talked to that. Uh, but there's also other um, areas of policy which feed into in-work poverty, because in-work poverty is not just the worker in work. It may well be a whole household which is said to be in in-work poverty. So other things that are actually um, relevant uh, policy wise to that are things like a second earner if it's a couple. So the Institute for Fiscal Studies shows, for example, that uh, single earner households with single earner couples with children are particularly likely to be in in work poverty. Well, you might think about a second earner in those uh, particular cases, or you might think about childcare costs, or you might think in some cases about the way in which the cost of housing has increased and Social Security has not increased to uh, match that. Um, and my own particular area, you might think about the individual non means tested benefits for the partner who happens to be out of the labour market. So for example, you've now got contributory employment and support allowance, which for some people only lasts for a year, and not for longer. And that person may still be ill, but may have no benefit to contribute to the household income. And so in work poverty may be in work poverty may be um, uh, continuing in that household. Uh, but the only focus is on the earner, it shouldn't be it should be on uh, other people in the household and other costs as well. Just in terms of social security shaping individual behaviour, I think that would be a whole other seminar and would be um, uh, of real interest. And there's clearly been uh, a focus on this recently, both in the kinds of cuts that we've been talking about, about the benefit cap, uh, trying to uh, make people go into work um, and the um, two child limit, trying to make people not have a third child. And there are other uh, examples. And of course, the behavioural unit and the nudge uh, sort of philosophy has become much more uh, important recently. Um, I um, think one, I've sorry. Got to, I've got to uh, create yeah. time, but what we, I'll, we'll come back to all of these issues and I'll explain that just in my final remarks, but thank you enormously and so much. Stephen, uh, any of the questions or you can respond to your fellow panelists uh, yeah I, I i thought actually helen's answer on the question around skills and, and job centers was 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 brilliant actually i mean I'm, I'm a big believer in in the role of the work coaches and i've seen some fabulous fabulous examples um in in different parts of the country on on how effective they can be um where i think there's a real weakness is um and it depends where in the country you are is the, the kind of ecosystem of other organizations that can work in partnership with JCP to deliver effective programs that really change things. So where I am based in, in far west Wales, um, where we don't have lots of big employers who can, um, 
you altruistically take part in training schemes and 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 and, and work collaboratively like that. It's been a real effort for the local teams. Um, finding meaningful w work opportunities, training opportunities for pretty much the same cohort of people that they see month after month, year after year. Um, and, and that's the kind of slightly d d depressing part. But, but what I would say is, you know, the government's embarked on this leveling up agenda. They've created new funding pots with the leveling up fund, the community renewal fund. And this is the, the post Brexit opportunity to replace EU funding. And of course, West Wales is a big recipient of that. Um, I'm a bit concerned that we're not really getting a, a joined up approach that can you know, really exploit some of the opportunities that this funding brings and that, you know, there's a danger that we end up just doing things rather very much like they've been done year after year. No, I think I think this is all correct. We at Res Publica, uh, my colleague Mark uh, and I wrote the original Devo Mank report and we've done countless reports and private consultancies for local authorities. The single biggest thing you could do in this country is create a single controlling mind at the local level within which you could fold all of these bespoke functions. That's almost the most important policy innovation that would allow all of the other uh, innovations to take place. But um, that we will address no doubt at a later date. This is the final seminar in our series. I'd like to thank once again, um, uh, Joseph Browntree uh, uh, Trust for supporting us uh, in this endeavor. We've had fantastic conversations. We're going to, all of these conversations are now legacy and will be recorded and are available uh, online. This will be available tomorrow. We are also going to produce a book um, that will be uh, a mixture of the wonderful academic uh, and policy insight we've had together with the MP's response. And there will be people in that book who haven't been able to speak because of time or official duties. And we will aim to launch that uh, sometime in the near future because getting MPs, because they're so busy, it's not a critique <laughs> to, to write and generate stuff is its own labor, but we will, we will succeed in that and we will launch that and we will broadcast that and the outcomes of that to you all. So it's been an enormous pleasure working with everybody uh, uh, over this last month. I look forward to deepening this, extending it and advancing it into actual policy areas and advocating for that. Um, um, with, uh, with colleagues uh, in Parliament and outside of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. It's been a great pleasure. Have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks very much, Philip. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Bye-bye.